Hello, I'm Tae Kim. It's a pleasure to be here. I am honored to have this opportunity to present at this Korean Mongolian Endoscopy Seminar. And thank you for the introduction, Professor Jin Lee. So on um, after ESD, various complications can occur. And among them, rare complications include the following. And today, I will focus on the most critical <clears throat> one, the most critical one among the rare complications, the delayed perforation. So the delayed perforation is a type of perforation that occurs after completion of the ESD. So it can be diagnosed when there is no intraoperative perforation during ESD and no free air is observed in the immediate post ESD chest x-ray. And evidence of perforation is clearly, clearly seen on the follow-up X-ray or CT scan, along with the signs of peritoneal irritation. So the incidence of intraoperative perforation during ESD is reported to be between 1% to 5%, but the delay for perforation is much rarer, which occurs in only 0.1% to 0.5% of cases. And I would like to present, present two contrasting cases of delayed perforation. In the first case, ESD was successfully done in a low body posterior wall without intraoperative perforation. And the chest x-ray taken immediately after the procedure showed no free air. ESD was done in the morning, but in the afternoon, Patients started complaining of persistent abdominal, very severe abdominal pain. A CT scan was performed and a perforation hole was found 14 hours after ESD. Emergency EGD was done three hours after the CT. We found a two centimeter sized perforation hole. The next day after ESD, primary repair operation was done, and the patient was discharged after usual post-OP care. Second case is much more alarming. ESD was done the high body posterior wall without intraoperative perforation and the immediate chest X-ray was normal. Then the patient complained of persistent abdominal pain from the night ESD was done. However, because X-ray was persistently normal, further workup was delayed and only pain management continued. Two days after ESD, the patient exhibited septic shock, but even at that time, X-ray was still normal. CT was performed in the ICU and ESD site perforation was detected. And although emergency operation was performed, Left colectomy was necessary because of septic shock related ischemia. This patient required prolonged treatment in the ICU for complicated intra abdominal infection. We can see from these cases that high level of clinical suspicion is required for successful treatment of delayed perforation. Recently, together with Professor Byung-Hun Min and Professor Jun Heng Lee, we analyzed our, our experience on this very topic and presented our findings in a paper. Let me introduce the observations we made in that paper. The crude incidence of delayed perforation was 0.1%. The median age in delayed perforation group was 71 years, which was significantly higher compared to those without delayed perforation. And although the statistical significance was not reached, proportion of patients with upper third tumor location was about three times higher in the delayed perforation group. The median time from ESD to the diagnosis of delayed perforation was about uh, around 28 hours. All patients with delayed perforation show severe persistent abdominal pain, but fever and leukocytosis was present in about half of the cases respectively. In 20% of the cases, cases interestingly, uh, follow-up chest x-ray did not show free air, necessitating the need for CT diagnosis. 
Furthermore, patients without free air showed significantly lower incidence of leukocytosis compared to patients with free air. I believe this point is very important because even in cases of delayed perforation, x-rays can continue to appear normal. And to make matters worse, when there's no free air, leukocytosis is also very rare, making the diagnosis even more difficult. So therefore, when the suspicion is high, CT scans should be actively performed. Out of the 15 patients with delayed perforation, three of them showed improvement without, uh, with conservative managements only, including fasting, PPI, and antibiotics. Endoscopic treatment was attempted in six cases with successful outcomes in three cases, while the remaining three cases required surgical intervention. Additionally, six patients underwent surgery, immediate surgery, and there were no perforation-related deaths in all cases. When comparing, two, when comparing patients who underwent surgery with those who did not, we observed the cases with a perforation size of less than one centimeter were, success, were successfully managed with non-surgical management. However, in cases where the perforation hole size exceed, exceeded one centimeter, surgical intervention was required for successful treatment. And we saw some statistical significance too. So in summary, delayed perforation occurred in 0.1% after gastric ESD in our hospital. The predominantly affected elderly individuals and persistent severe abdominal pain was present in all cases. And fever, leukocytosis were present in approximately half of the cases. Uh, and in 20% of cases, free air was not visible on chest X-ray despite the presence of perforation. In such cases, leukocytosis was even less common. Regarding treatment outcomes, perforations smaller than one centimeter were successfully managed without surgery. In conclusion, delayed perforation is a rare but serious complications that occur after that can occur after ESD. Therefore, if severe abdominal pain persists after ESD, delayed perforation should be suspected, even in the chest, even if the chest X-ray appear normal. And thank you for your. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So how do you pronounce thank you in uh, Mongolian? Berta. Okay. Berta. 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 Yes. Okay. Does anyone have any questions regarding the presentation? So I have questions. It's okay. Uh, successfully treated without surgery means it's endoscopic clipping or just medications? Uh, what mean? The half of them, right? Uh -huh. if you see right here, uh -huh. half of them uh, were tried initially uh, and attempted for endoscopic clipping, uh -huh. but uh, the other three improved with fasting, NPO, and PPI. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and three of them improved with clipping. Uh -huh. So we, had, we saw six cases that improved without surgery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, non-surgery group, but the hospital stay is uh, sometimes 18 or 11, 10 days. So do we have to try non-surgical treatment? What about go to the surgery room for all the delayed patient, delayed population patient? Uh, that could be an option, yeah. but it's uh, still a surgery. Mm -hmm. So, it's uh, it could be better to avoid surgery, especially in the elderly patients. Elderly and delay, patient, yeah. yes, and the delayed perforation yeah. more likely occurs in the elderly patients. So, uh, in cases with a lot of comorbidities, I think uh, wait and see option could be an option. And if the perforation hole is more than one centimeter, endoscopic clipping could be tried. Okay. That's my opinion. Uh, until now, I have no case of delayed. Uh, operation, <laughs> but uh, I still think if I have a case of delayed operation, uh, my first choice will still uh, surgical consultation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because uh, laparoscopic, laparoscopic small closure mm -hmm. is not a big surgery, just a simple closure. It's not a radical gastrectomy. So the, the chance of uh, complication maybe not so high, mm. okay? So uh, when the chest X-ray is normal, how can we suspect delayed perforation? Because we cannot check 
CT scan for every patient. So the the one point I would like to emphasize is that all patients with delayed perforation mm -hmm. showed very, very severe abdominal pain mm -hmm. and rigidity and signs of peritoneal irritation that lasted for more than 24 hours. So mm -hmm. the day when you do ESD, the day of ESD, uh, you know, just pain and some irritation could be possible, but if it persists over 24 hours and the abdominal guard and peritoneal irritation signs doesn't go away for more than 24 hours, mm -hmm. I think uh, that allows me that um, that is a, a good reason for mm -hmm. CT scan. Yeah, so, so uh, pain after ESD without perforation and pain by delayed perforation is quite different. Right. Yeah, so experienced physician can easily I have That's a feeling that there is something wrong. Right. <laughs> if you have something bad feeling, okay, it's time to do CT scan that, to correct. check. Okay. Mm. Okay. Thank you very much, you. Uh, Professor you. Kim, for your nice presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Now we will move on to the next uh, presentation. Professor Kim, how, why, do, why don't you help? Focus uh, <laughs> 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 on. For the So I'd like to introduce uh, uh, the next speaker. Uh, the next speaker is uh, a very important person because uh, she always examine our pathology, our ESP specimen. So uh, Professor Ahn is our pathologist uh, reviewing uh, uh, at least half of our ESP cases. So our topic today is pathologic diagnosis of gastric ESP specimen. Okay, Professor. Thank you for your kind introduction <laughs> and thank you for inviting me to this important meeting. Um, uh, in the pathology report of ESD specimen, we provide important information for management of patients with uh, early gastric cancer, including <laughs> histology, size, depth of invasion, margin status, and lymphatic emboli. Uh, of them, uh, today I will present three uh, three topics on recent update of ESD histology. Uh, before start, uh, this is the latest version of WHO histology classification of gastric cancer. Uh, I will explain each part later with each example. Uh, the first case is an ESD specimen from the low body. A 26 millimeter size tumor is observed and it's confined within the mucosa. Uh, we can see infiltration of tumor cells into muscularis mucosa. Uh, uh, the composition of tumor cells um, is uh, it consists of a uh, moderate differentiated uh, tubular adenocarcinoma, accounting for uh, about 60%. And polycoistic carcinoma non signaling cell type accounting for about 40%. And this is the final pathology report of this patient. All histologic subtype consisting of this tumor was described like this and was mixed type by low rank classification. Uh, although this tumor was confined within the mucosa, it had lymphatic tumor emboli. Therefore, this patient underwent a, a surgical resection. And in the gastrectomy specimen, there was no residual tumor, but a lymph node metastasis was detected in one lymph node uh, from 4-6. Uh, this is the WHO classification of gastric cancer again. Uh, the terminology of undifferentiated and differentiated is actually old term and confusing, but uh, this terminology is still widely used for uh, ESD indication. And for current 
uh, classification, uh, well differentiated tubular and moderately differentiated tubular and papillary type belong to differentiated type and poorly differentiated uh, tubular adenocarcinoma and poorly cohesive uh, carcinoma belong to undifferentiated type. And this undifferentiated type by non-camera classification is different from undifferentiated carcinoma. And uh, many studies have reported that tumors of mixed differentiated type and undifferentiated type components have a higher risk of lymph node metastasis than tumors with only one component. Uh, therefore, uh, in the ESD uh, pathology report, uh, the essential component is that histologic main subtype should be described and at the same time as a conditional element. Um, if histologic um, component is mixed or heterogeneous, the description according to the proportion of each subtype uh, uh, is recommended, uh, like this example. And in the study on signal link carcinoma, uh, early gastric cancer, the pure signal link cell carcinoma, like this example, showed a, a good prognosis compared with mixed signal link cell carcinoma uh, patients. And in their study, uh, 26 patients with pure signal link carcinoma who uh, fulfilled expanded ESD indication had no lymph node or metastasis. Therefore, this author suggests that early signaling cell carcinoma should be further classified by the purity or percentage of the signaling cell carcinoma component. Uh, let's move on to the next topic. Uh, this is this uh, resection specimen from high body shows deep uh, infiltration of tumor with dense lymphoid infiltrate. It, uh, it maybe looks like a lymph node here. And at the high power view, we can see poorly formed uh, tumor cells. And these tumor cells are positive for uh, EBV or insight hybrid digestion. And this is the pathology report of ESD specimen. The histologic type was diagnosed as adenocarcinoma with lymphoid stroma. And because of deep submucosal invasion, this patient underwent uh, total gastrectomy and uh, and the final pathology of a uh, resection specimen was no residual tumor and no lymph node metastasis. And this type of tumor was variously called as lymphoepithelioma-like carcinoma or medullary carcinoma. But according to the current WHO classification, the official terminology is adenocarcinoma with lymphoid stroma. And the most prominent histology feature is dense lymphoid infiltrate. And, and the EBV, uh, EBV positive gastric cancer, and this histologic type has considerable uh, overlap. But uh, this histologic type for 10% uh, for were EBV negative. So it is not identical. And EBV positive gastric cancer consists of about 9% of gastric cancer and is common in male and commonly located in a proximal stomach and ha usually have favorable prognosis because of uh, immune reaction. And more, paid atten uh, more attention is paid to this cancer uh, because uh, for advanced cancer, it shows a good response to immunotherapy. And for, and for early gastric cancer, uh, even with a uh, deep submucosal invasion and poor differentiation, uh, EBV positive gastric cancer uh, showed uh, usually very low risk of lymph node metastasis. And some uh, suggest that this may be a good candidate for ESD, uh, or even they have a uh, submucosal invasion, but we need uh, more data on it. And let's move on to the last topic. Uh, this ESD specimen from angle uh, showed mucosal cancer, and this is the tumor part. And histologically, this finger-like uh, projection is distinct from conventional tubular adenocarcinoma. And the 
a final pathology uh, was papillary adenocarcinoma and based on pathology report, and this uh, it was a curative resection. Uh, papillary adenocarcinoma is a relatively rare subtype of gastric cancer, with, often with uh, XPT growth pattern. And for advanced uh, gastric cancer, it is uh, associated with a higher frequency of liver metastasis and poor survival. And for early gastric cancer, uh, a few studies show that the prognosis of this type is poorer than that of non papillary gastric cancer. Therefore, the indication for ESD in papillary type early gastric cancer remain controversial. And uh, according and recently, a Korean multicenter study reported a clinical outcome of ESD for papillary early gastric cancer. And for 84 patients with curative ESD reaction, uh, resection, three had a uh, recurrence, and all of these three were cured with ESD. Uh, therefore, they uh, the authors conclude uh, suggest that the clinical outcome of ESD in papillary type EGC were relatively favor uh, favorable, and ESD is considered safe if indication that uh, appropriate indications are confirmed. Uh, this is the uh, last page for my talk. Uh, I Today, I briefly introduced recent update on a papillary uh, subtype and a uh, mixed subtype. Uh, actually, uh, in recent WH classification, the mixed uh, adenocarcinoma uh, do exist, but actually we pathologists don't use this term much. And and, uh, and I also introduced adenocarcinoma with lymphoid stroma uh, with relation to ESD. Um, uh, thank you very much for yeah. your kind attention. Uh, thank you, Professor Ahn, for your uh, wonderful presentation. Does anyone have any questions? Professor Kim, come close and talk. Uh, thank you, Professor Ahn, for your nice lecture. I have one question. Uh, is this, I have a question about terminology. Is mixed type gastric cancer is the same term, term with uh, carcinoma with histological heterogeneity? Uh, uh, for example, if you have if you have a cancer with moderately differentiated adenocarcinoma with papillary adenocarcinoma. Mm. Is that a mixed type adenocarcinoma or a EGC with histological heterogeneity? Ah, thank you for your good question. Uh, in the current classification, the mixed mixed carcinoma, uh, actually there is a there is no clear definition, but usually it uh, it means the mixed type of differentiated and on differentiated time. So it the the for example the mixture of papillary and tubular does not belong to this type. And for the uh, tumor so, heterogeneity, uh, it suggests that the PD component more than five percent uh, is considered as to have tumor or heterogeneity. Okay. Uh, yeah. So if <laughs> Uh, well differentiated type and moderate differentiated type is uh, found in a single tumor. Yeah. It is a histological heterogeneity, but not a mixed type. Because uh, one is well differentiated and yeah. other part is moderate differentiated, all differentiated type. Uh, mix, uh, only well differentiated and moderate, mm -hmm. and it is not heterogeneity. Heterogeneity mm -hmm. means when PD component is used. So, oh, yeah. so, 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 <laughs> uh, heterogeneity is a uh, mixed type, exactly the same? No, different. Because it, there, mm -hmm. uh, there is no clear definition, mm -hmm. usually, uh, like about half, half differentiated and half undifferentiated. Um, okay, so <laughs> the terminal is still tricky. <laughs> so, if uh, undifferentiated type is uh, like uh, 3%, do you call it in mixed or no, just? Uh, in in that case, it is not mixed subtype. But so the criteria I, is five percent, like uh, about fifty percent, half and half. Fifty percent. Yeah, but in the case, I can say it, this tumor has a tumoral heterogeneity. Heterogeneity. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
So, uh, so mixed and heterogeneous is uh, different. So we have to develop some uh, further uh, clear uh, definition. So anyway, um, I have a question about uh, signet ring cell carcinoma. So in a forcep biopsy, the result is signet ring cell carcinoma. On, in the surgery, Many cases are uh, only differentiated uh, only cohesive carcinoma with uh, some signet component mm -hmm. or something. Yeah. So the biopsy and surgery is yeah. sometimes different in signet ring cell families. Yeah. What's your opinion on that? Uh, because of the usually the histology of gastric cancer is heterogeneous. Mm -hmm. So pure the Having only pure type is actually rare. Mostly a, a compost of mixed type, like a pure signal ring cell type and poorly cohesive non-signal type is mixed. That is more common than pure composition. So uh, for pathology diagnosis, we usually diagnose the major histology component. Okay. So it can be different. Okay. So uh, Amaruba, uh, your pathologist use the term poorly cohesive carcinoma or which term does your pathologist use? Because polycoesive carcinoma is a kind of very tricky term. Yes, uh, our pathology sometimes give to us signet ring cell component, but sometimes undifferentiated. I don't know. So. Or poorly. Poorly. Mm. So poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma and polycoesive adenocarcinoma is a different thing. <laughs> <laughs> what is the difference though? What, what would you say? Yeah. Uh, poorly uh, differentiated uh, adenocarcinoma uh, and poorly cohesive uh, carcinoma is a different meaning. Yeah. What's the difference? Yeah, but the, the problem is like that depends on pathologist and pathologist yeah. they they use different terms. Mm. But according to the defi uh, definition, the poorly cohesive carcinoma is a diffuse type. Yeah, and tubular adenocarcinoma poorly differentiated type belongs to intestinal or indeterminate types. So the low rank classification is, is basically different. Yeah. So poorly differentiated type is uh, usually solid type. Yeah. Uh, and it has uh, sometimes have uh, uh, glandular has... component. Yeah. Uh, it may or may not, uh, but it's solid. Mm -hmm. The cells are yeah. coherent, <laughs> but poorly cohesive, the cell is uh, Separate. Yeah. Dispersed separately. Yeah. I have a question. If a pathologist give to us adenocarcinoma with lymphoid stroma, it, it means uh piston wire virus, virus induced gastric cancer. Is it right? So uh regarding your question, uh, mm. she said there is an overlap about 85 percent. 85 percent of uh Adenocarcinoma lymphoid stroma has uh -huh. EB virus positive, but still there are 15% uh, negative cases. Mm -hmm. So is there any difference between EB virus negative and EB virus positive uh, lymphoepithelial medullary carcinoma? Is there any histological difference uh -huh. between EB virus positive and EB virus negative cases? Uh, actually, the histologically is similar, but Very similar. but according to Professor Lin's study a few years ago, the prognosis is different. Than so, EB virus positive is uh, oh, better, better prognosis. Yeah. So, if EB virus positive, uh, lympho, uh, medullary carcinoma, uh, the criteria of surgery can be 1,000 micrometer rather than 500 micrometer standard. <laughs> what do you think? It still is complicated. Mm -hmm. So if the uh, EB virus positive cancer has a 650 uh, <laughs> micrometer invasion, you still require recommend surgery? Yeah, uh, that is good to my policy. Mm -hmm. It's another tricky one. <laughs> another tricky one, yeah. So, Recently, uh, we reviewed about uh, more than 120 cases of early LELC 
that underwent surgery within our institution for more than 10 years. And we found that the in cases with more than 500 micrometers of somical invasion, the lymph node metastasis rate was 7.8%. Uh, so it depends on whether what you think about that rate. So if you think 7, seven to 8% mm -hmm. of lymph node metastasis rate is high, I think you should go for surgery. Mm -hmm. if, that is, if you think that's uh, that's similar, similar to more than 90% of chances mm -hmm. of, of cure, then you just choose observations. Okay. But the, yeah, I think it's... So the, uh, we should think about the 7% recurrence rate, but uh, in other aspects, we have very good uh, medication. Hemorrhizuma works very well to those recurrences. So uh, we have to talk. Almost the earlier thing is the E5 positive, which is the good biomarker for the hemorrhizuma. Oh, yeah. OK. Thank you very much oh, for your you. wonderful <laughs> presentation. Thank you. Excuse okay, me. Let's move on to our third topic. Uh, our assistant, uh, why don't you help to present <laughs> Excuse me. Excuse me. I have question. We have okay, question now. <laughs> yeah. One more question. Ah, uh, thank you very much. I'm sorry. Have we time? Yeah. Any question uh, is welcome. Uh, 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 thank you very much. My name is Bai Chin Yim. Hmm? I am thoracic surgeon of the National Cancer Center of Mongolia. Nice to meet you. And thank you very much for the important presentation. Okay. So I have two questions. I have two questions. First one is the what's the criteria for the checking EBV in cyto hybridization? What's the criteria? So when do you apply EB virus inside to hybridization and how do you interpret the result? Okay. Mm. Uh, for for advanced gastric cancer, uh, for the resection specimen, I mean the surgery specimen, we routine, routinely perform our uh, EBV inside to hybridization. But for ESD specimen, I uh, we perform cases uh, of uh, which, although histologically, this subtype is suspicious. So in uh, surgery patient, we routinely yeah. perform EB virus inside to hybridization. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you very much. So okay, inside the to hybrid is always clear? Uh, actually, that, uh, yeah, yeah, the interpretation is quite straightforward uh. and it's not difficult because most tumor cells are positive, but rarely we see of uh, focal positivity of for e EV by but EV three but it is very rare. Okay, what's your next question? Uh, inside the hybridism is the some limited examination. So instead of the inside the hybrid hybridization, have we any choice of the immunohistochemistry or something like? That other choice. Uh, of, uh, from my experience, this EVV in situ is the uh, actually best best option, and and once it is set up, then it is easy to perform with other immunohistochemistry. chemistry. So I recommend this method for EVV detection. What is the price? Uh, Inside to hybridization <laughs> and immuno staining. Uh, Which one is uh, more expensive? Oh, I, I'm sorry, <laughs> I, I have no idea for the price, uh, but hi. I believe that it is not that expensive. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Actually, ISH is the only detects the messenger RNA, but immunohistochemistry chemistry is the detecting protein. So which is the most impact and effective? Can we detect the EBV? Okay, so uh, EB virus immunohistochemistry and EB virus inside hybridization. Do you have any comparison data between them, the sensitivity oh. and specificity? Oh, actually, I, I only experienced this 
in such hybridization. Mm -hmm. And in most institutes in Korea, they also use this. So I you know it's the chemistry is possible. Right? Oh, actually, I, I, just, I have no uh, I don't have a good answer for that because I never experienced that uh, uh, IHC. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Uh, her answer is that uh, EB virus is always uh, uh, evaluated by inside to hybridization in Korea. And in Korea, uh, there is no experience of EB virus uh, immunohistochemistry. So we, can, we have no data about the comparison between them. Is it clear? Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Next move Thank on. you very much. Thank uh, you. Next move on to our next presentation. Uh, next presentation will be done by Professor Min, which he, uh, his talk today is uh, follow up strategy after ESD for early gastric cancer. Because uh, ESD uh, has some, uh, no, don't have lymph, lymph node dissection. So we have some risk of local or distant metastasis after the treatment. So ESD follow-up strategy is very important topic. So Professor Min. Thank you for the kind introduction. Today, I'm going to talk about the follow-up strategies after endoscopy treatment for the oligastric cancer. The major advantage of endoscopy resection is the stomach is preserved, and therefore the patient's quality of life is much less impaired compared to reticular gastrectomy. However, as the stomach is saved, local and metaphoric recurrence can occur after ESD. In addition, endoscopy resection has a major limitation in the original lymph node cannot be removed during the procedure. So entailing the theoretical risk of extragastric recurrence. Indeed, our data show that the ESD had comparable overall survival, but significantly higher risk of metachronous recurrence compared to surgery. If these various forms of recurrence are not detected at an early stage, invasive retinal gastrectomy would be required and even mortality is possible, especially in cases of extragastric recurrence. And therefore, an established surveillance strategy is required for the early detection of recurrence. These surveillance strategies should be based on the type, instance, pattern, and the timing of recurrence after ESD for the early gastric cancer. Several biomarkers, such as atherapy or the helicobacter infection status, might help refine the follow-up strategy. Today, I'm going to focus on the metachronous recurrence or the extragastric recurrence, because theoretically, local recurrence would not occur after the curative resection. Recent Korean guidelines recommend annual or the biannual EDD and the CD scan for the early detection of metachronous or the extragastric recurrence after curative ESD. Japanese guidelines are somewhat different. They recommend only annual EGD without CD scan for the ECRA A resection, which include both differentiated and undifferentiated mucosal cancer. For ECRA B resection, which include differentiated SM1 cancer, they recommend annual or biannual EGD for the metachronous recurrence and abdominal ultrasonography or a CD scan for the extragastric recurrence. As the ultrasonography, which has major limitation in lymph node detection, or even no follow-up is recommended for the extra gas recurrence in Japanese guideline, there can be the concern about the missing extra gas recurrence, which might result in the fatal outcomes. So now let's talk about the intragastric metachronous recurrence first. In our hospital, five-year cumulative incidence of 
Attack currency recurrence after EST was 3.6%, and majority of recurrent cancers were the early gastric cancers, all of which were curatively treated with EST or the surgery. The cumulative incidence curve of metachronous recurrence revealed the linear increase, which implies a constant incidence rate of metachronous recurrence. Median time of recurrence was 30 months after the ESD. Data from the Atom Medical Center was quite similar to our data. A five-year cumulative incidence of metachronous recurrence after ESD was 4.7% and all cases were the early gastric cancer. Cumulative incidence curve of metachronous recurrence also showed the linear increase with 10-year cumulative survival rising up to 11.3%. This again implies a constant incidence rate of metachronous recurrence, and the mean annual incidence in Asa Medical Center was 0.9%. This slide shows the data from the National Cancer Center, Tokyo, Japan. Five-year cumulative incidence of metachronous recurrence after EST was 9.5%, which was far higher than the dose in Korea. In contrast to our experience in Korea, 2.9% of patients with the metachronous recurrence died of the gastric cancer recurrence, although all the recurrent regions were the early gastric cancer, and they didn't report the recurrence. They didn't report the advanced gastric cancer instance. Pattern and timing of metachronous recurrence in Japan were quite similar to those in Korea. The cumulative instance curve also showed the linear increase with 10-year cumulative survival rising up to 22%. 22.7%. This far higher rate of occurrence in Japan might be caused by the different criteria of diagnosing cancer between Korean and Japanese pathologists. Mean annual incidence was reported as 3.5% in Osaka University Hospital data. Given this data showing contrast incidence rate of metachronous recurrence over more than five years, surveillance endoscopy might be required at least five years after the curative ESD. When to stop surveillance EGD would depend on the patient's age and the patient's comorbidity. From now on, I'm going to talk about the extra gas recurrence. In our hospital, Instance of extra gas recurrence after curative ESD was 0.15% during median 47 months of follow up. Among two cases of extra gas recurrence, one was lymph node metastasis from mucosal cancer, and the other was lymph node metastasis from SM1 cancer. And this patient with the SM1 cancer died of gastric cancer recurrence. Timing of extra gas recurrence was 61 and 48 months after curative ESD, respectively. Notably, mucosal early gastric cancer cases with the extra gas recurrence met ECRA A criteria, where the Japanese guidelines do not recommend surveillance CT scan even after the curative ESD. The data from Alpha Medical Center was quite similar to our data. Instance of extra gas recurrence after curative ESD was 0.14% during median 37 months of follow up. Among five cases of extra gas recurrence, three were from mucosal cancer and two were from SM1 cancer. The timing of extra gas recurrence was from 9 to 36 months after curative ESD. All three mucosal early gastric cancers with extra gastric recurrence met ECRA A criteria again. And distant metastasis also occurred from mucosal early gastric cancer cases, even confined to lamina propria layer. And this patient died of gastric cancer recurrence. In two Japanese Mercenta studies, instance of extra gastric recurrence 
uh, the curative ESD was 0.06% during median 56 months of follow-up in one study and 0.1% in another study. Among six cases of estrogastric recurrence in the study of Tanabe et al., three were from mucosal oligastric cancer and three were from the SM1 cancer. Timing of estrogastric recurrence was from 16 to 87 months after curative ESD in Japan. All three mucosal oligastric cancer cases with estrogastric recurrence met in QRA criteria, again, where Japanese guidelines do not recommend surveillance CD scan after curative ESD. This metastasis occurred from both mucosal and cell mucosal oligastric cancers. One of two patients with estrogastric recurrence from mucosal oligastric cancer died of recurrence. This Korean and Japanese data show that the rate of estrogastric recurrence after curative ESD was 0.04% to 0.1% for the mucosal oligastric cancer and 0.9% to 1.5% for the SL1 cancer. So the rate was quite low, especially for the mucosal oligastric cancer, but it is definitely not the zero. Furthermore, even in mucosal oligastric cancer, meeting the EQRA A criteria, distant metastasis and even gastric cancer related deaths occurred in both Korea and even in Japan. Timing of extragastric recurrence ranged widely from 9 to 87 months after curative ESD. And given these data, abdominal CT scan rather than ultrasonography might be required for at least five years after curative ESD for both mucosal and SM1 oligastric cancer. So let me summarize my talk today. For the metachronous recurrence, patients carry lifelong risk of metachronous recurrence with constant incidence rate, and they usually have established precancerous changes such as atrophy and intestinal metaplasia. Therefore, annual or biannual surveillance endoscopy might be required at least five years after curious ESD. When to stop surveillance EGD would depend on the patient age and the comorbidity. Finally, the rate of extragastric recurrence ranges from the 0.06% to 0.15% which was quite low, but again, definitely not the zero. Timing of extragastric recurrence ranges widely from 9 to 87 months after curative ESD. We found distant metastasis and gastric cancer-related deaths occurred even in patients with the mucosal oligastric cancer. Given this data, annual or the biannual Abdominal CT scan rather than ultrasonography might be required at least five years after curative ESD for the both mucosa and SM1 oligastric cancer. And thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Professor Min. Uh, it's a wonderful uh, a summary of extra gastric recurrence, uh, uh, not only in Korea, but also in Japan. So, does anyone have any questions regarding this topic? I have a question from yeah, Solomon. So even uh, mucosal uh, cancer is can make the distant metastasis. According to uh, pathological evolutions, it's missed to uh, found the liver scholar invasion positive or vein invasion positive. Is is it possible to miss? So uh, so his his question is uh, 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 Tiny findings such as uh, lymphatic invasion or venous invasion can be missed during your routine uh, ESD pathology examination. Uh, it, it can be, but it's a digester. So <laughs> we, we try not to miss any, especially lymphatic emboli, but it can be a possible scenario. Yeah. So, Professor Min, <laughs> did you review the uh, initial uh, ESD pathology 
when you meet the uh, extra gastric recurrence cases? Actually, uh, luckily, mm -hmm. I have not experienced any extra gastric recurrence. Uh, uh, I was only was only one liter on the data since, and and then I asked my pathologist to review the original ESD slide, and and they performed the the deep dissection mm -hmm. to detect some. Uh, very tiny lymphatic invasion or something, mm -hmm. but but they, but in the fetal review, no lymphatic or vascular or vascular invasion was detected in the fetal review. Okay, so pathology is very correct examination, but uh, it is not one hundred percent. So we think that we still have very low, actually less than zero point five percent of extragastric lymph node. Uh, metastasis during the five follow period, it is quite acceptable considering the average one percent surgery related mortality. So such a tiny uh, risk is uh, clinically acceptable. But uh, but the surgical mortality, you know, that depend on the hospital volume. So in our hospital. The surgical mortality is less than 1.2 percent. Okay, less than 0, 0. 0.2 percent. Yeah, mm -hmm. not very low. Okay, so in a uh, national average, it is yeah. 0. 0.9 or 1.0 percent uh, of surgical mm -hmm. related mortality, including obstruction and uh, emergency surgeries. Mm -hmm. So routine uh, elective surgery. The uh, surgery related mortality usually less than 0 0.2 in major mm -hmm. uh, cancer centers. That is that number 0.2 percent is very comparable to our uh, extra gastric recurrence rate. Mm -hmm. So still clinically mm -hmm. acceptable because surgery related death occurs today or this month, <laughs> but uh, recurrence related death occurs five years later. So if the rate is the same, the five year difference is still very important. Okay, okay. not today, five years later. <laughs> uh, so uh, so based on Japanese data, uh, ICRA A uh, should be recommended. Uh, so, so CT or bottom endoscopy should be recommended for ICRA A cases, even in Japan. Maybe that's your opinion. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. So yeah. did you ask Japanese doctors whether <laughs> they follow the no CT policy in ICRA cases? Yeah, uh, in, in uh, it's two or three years ago, uh, I met a Japanese very famous endoscopy mm. in the in, in the. <laughs> Medical conference, and I asked them about your your question, and, mm -hmm. and they said, "Oh, I do from the surveillance city." Yeah, 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 exactly. So all my <laughs> Japanese friends always said that they do CT even in ICRA A cases. So guideline is guideline. <laughs> it's a practice, it's a practice. It is. Uh, it sometimes it is different. So. Why don't you ask your Japanese friends, Korean friends, before you follow uh, a very unusual guideline? Uh -huh. Okay, okay. <laughs> guideline is different. Yeah. So thank you very much, Professor yeah. Min, for your very clear uh, uh, summary of the extracessory recurrences. Okay. So uh, thank uh, you very much. I have one question. I'm yeah. sorry. Again. Very good. Uh, What's your question? Uh, thank you very much. After ESD, uh, professor recommended to the CT scan and endoscopic be only two times a year. But how we manage the, this examination? One time check or between gap is the three months? Which one is the better? For example, same time. So you mean endoscopic? The... Yeah. Uh, for example, the... uh, same time checking endoscopy and CT scan. Okay, CT scan. his question is that, uh, for example, uh, plan one is uh, CT and EGD six months later. Plan two, uh, CT three months later, EGD uh, six months later, Maybe. and another CT that, well, 
What's your what's your plan? management? Uh, what's your management? Usually, Korean patients don't want to visit the <laughs> hospital very often. Uh, <laughs> they want they usually like to the one time so so, so one day service no. or something. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, so intragastric recurrence uh, such as uh, local recurrence and uh, uh, metachronous recurrence. Uh, and uh, extra gastric recurrence, such as lymph node or hepatic, is quite unrelated event. So intragastric recurrence and extra gastric recurrence uh, is quite unrelated. So I think uh, we don't need to separate these things. We can do it together. Mm. Okay. 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 Thank you. That's a very good question. I yeah. think. Uh, uh, very thank you very much. Okay. Uh, let's move on to uh, a case presentation uh, by Dr. Amaruba. Uh, it's about uh, uh, an interesting case related to our first presentation. Yes. Okay. So. Marco, Marco. Yes. Okay, that's it. A okay, uh, 67 years old male uh, referred to us to check the uh, early gastric cancer. So he has uh, two flat lesions in gastric lower body in anterior wall, and another is located in antrum and greater curve. So we plan to perform a routinely uh, uh, check that lesions. So one is uh, around uh, uh, Elevated lesions in lower body. Uh, another is uh, antrum, but antrum lesion is a pathology diagnosis was uh, low grade dysplasia. So we uh, checked again this lesion and, and found new lesions near the antrum lesions, but carefully switched the MBR method. It's uh, very uh, flat and expanded uh, lesions. So we uh, uh, Taking the biopsy and biopsy result was high grade dysplasia. Uh, uh, pointer does not work. Okay. At, uh, ah, June, ah, so okay. Gonna... Okay. So uh, we uh, plan to uh, EST same time that two lesions. So uh, EST was done routinely without no complications and no uh, side effect side events. So pathology. The result was the lower body anterior wall side was high grade dysplasia and antrum is low grade dysplasia. And that procedure uh, was done uh, around uh, from 5 to 6 p.m. It to take around one hour. But in the morning, uh, the patient uh, felt the abdominal sewer pain and we gave to him a uh, uh, insects medications, but still he felt the uh, sewer pain, and we gave to him a morphine, but it, still he felt the sewer pain. So we uh, underwent a CT scan, but CT scan revealed air, air uh, gas and uh, some uh, local uh, liquid collections around the uh, gastric area. So we planned to. Uh, uh, consult the surgeons and then the, we undergo emergency surgery. So do, during the emergency surgery, we uh, checked the endoscope and we uh, found the two holes, the margin side, margin side, but it, it was located in uh, lower body anterior wall side. So recent uh, Japanese uh, data, Nagasaki uh, University Hospital team uh, 740 patients included that study. So only uh, seven patients uh, had uh, delayed perforations. So uh, among the seven patients, the five patients underwent emergency surgery and the two patients uh, managed by conservative treatment. 
Interestingly, the most of the uh, delayed perfusion locations was uh, gastric lower body. So, as you know, the uh, delayed perfusion is uh, only uh, diagnosed by CT scan or EGD. So, delayed perfusion following gastric is typically occurs one or two days later. So, procedure is the reported rate 0.4%. The primary cause of delayed perfusions are tissue ischemia and necrosis due to excessive uh, energization of the mass layer. Intraoperative perfusions are usually small in diameter. Uh, delayed perfusions often present themselves as a relatively large. So, that is my okay. case. Thank you very much for your uh, dangerous <laughs> case. Uh, so, uh, in your case, uh, is there any risk factors for delayed operation? Uh, yes, we uh, checked again that patient's uh, 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 history. Mm -hmm. So, only uh, five or four years ago, he underwent two uh, coronary stenting. Yeah. And uh, endoscope, uh, no. The cardiography revealed ejection fraction is 35 percent. So the the he had some chronic heart failure. That is maybe the reason of okay. delayed perfusion. Yeah. Heart failure can lead to the, uh, poor uh, vascularization to yes. the ESD site, yes. which may cause may cause necrosis. Okay. Yes. So, we just so, guess. So how? Do you have any percentage of delayed operation in your institution? Mm, uh, not yet. Only one case. Only one case. Yeah, we yeah. had. Oh, only one case. Yeah, yeah. So you uh you mentioned the, the Nagasaki uh, report and uh, the rate of pop delayed operation was one percent in Nagasaki University, which is. Uh, very high. Uh, in usually it is less than one point five, but it is one percent is very high. And the location was Antrum is very unusual. So, uh, but Professor Kim, you are a delayed population. Uh, 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 <laughs> first author of the delayed population case. So why can you give some comment on the location and high uh, population rate of Nagasaki studies? Okay, so I think the statistical significance in that study was not reached as far as my experience. So antrum is antrum and lower body it is a common site for tumor occurrence. Mm. So it's natural that you see more cases with delayed perforation in the lower third because that's a, that's a common location for tumor in the first okay. place. Okay, so, so I think. Upper third, if you select more cases, uh, I think you might see more delayed perforation in the upper third. Okay. In my personal uh, uh, experience or thinking, uh, so uh, aggressive endoscopists sometimes make delayed perforation. I mean, if uh, you want to make a large resection margin, <laughs> if you want to cut in the uh, lower third of the submucosal layer, uh, the uh, chance of recurrence is almost zero, but there is some case of delayed bleeding or delayed operation. That's a very uh, uh, common procedure. So uh, I'm a rather conservative ESP doctor. So that's why I do not have a delayed operation <laughs> until now. So maybe, so where do you cut during the submucosal dissection? Upper third, middle third, or lower third? Upper side, middle side. Uh, this is submucosal layer. Mm -hmm. in the, uh, you are in uh, the submucosal uh, dissection. Which is your target? Middle third, upper third, or lower third? Yes, that is good questions because uh, I uh, really want to dissect deeply side. Deep side. Yeah, it's my uh, okay, one. Okay. Yeah. That's why maybe that I make this. Uh, yeah. Excessive coagulation. Uh, yeah. So my uh, suggestion is that uh, this is flat adenoma mm -hmm. rather than cancer. Mm -hmm. In this case, uh, your target can be middle third or upper third. Yeah. That is uh, possible. 
But if it is a cancer and a little bit of a mucosal depression or something, mm -hmm. your target is definitely a lower salt. So the target of some mucosal dissection can be different by the evaluation, histological evaluation. So you don't need to do big job for uh, mm -hmm. adenomas. <laughs> it's my personal idea. Yeah. Oh, I have a question. Okay, question. Is there any hypothesis why we're delaying the formation of curves in certain place of the stomach? Maybe the color of approach or uh, blood saturation is poor? That is an absolutely good question. Can I answer now? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, it's been reported that the blood supply is quite different in muscle layer depth. The thickness of the muscle layer is different. But uh, till now, I haven't found a satisfactory, uh, uh, steadfast scientific evidence of that issue specifically. But there are a lot of hypotheses. Yes, yeah, sure. But uh, uh, on well, based on our experience, uh, the walls of gastric layer is much more thinner. The proximal stomach is that is that your experience too? Yeah. So the uh, the muscle structure of the stomach differs depending on the location. In some areas, there are uh, inner circular and outer longitudinal and intermediate oblique layers. Three layers that is safe area, but the uh, upper body lateral side. Uh, there is a uh, inner circular and outer longitudinal. There is no uh, middle circular layer, which means the muscle layer is thinner at that area. So that kind of muscle structure matters. And typically, antrum is uh, easy to handle. <laughs> we do it very uh, stable, so we call dissection. But upper body area is sometimes uh, we make uh, some thermal damage to the muscle layer during the procedure. So the difficult location and thin muscle layer, that makes why upper body lateral side makes the higher chance of uh, the operation. And also in my uh, case, when I fought again, and that time maybe I inject not too much, and also I did aggressively cutting the margin area. Mm -hmm. I think that is the main problem. Maybe. Okay. So because in a cutting, injection, not so, yeah, not very so in, important. But in that area, so if you inject some water, it, the elevation does not high. So yeah. So uh, weak point has difficult. So weak and difficult, weak, weak stomach and difficult location. Actually, that is the same area, so that makes why that location is uh, problematic. Okay, thank you very much for your wonderful and very uh, uh, interesting case with the learning issue. So, uh, the final presentation will be my case. Today, we, uh, all of our discussion was about early gastric cancer. So I prepared a very advanced gastric cancer. Okay, my case is a very old gentleman uh, with abdominal pain. Uh, three years after gastric ESD for adenoma with high grade dysplasia. Uh, three years ago, uh, Yes, they was done for uh, adenoma with high-grade dysplasia. There is nothing special uh, in this case. Uh, in the follow-up endoscopy, at uh, last year, summer, 
it was clear. Number what? Do you agree that uh, endoscopy <laughs> is clear at yeah. this time? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. July, last year, July. Yeah, we found nothing wrong in the endoscopy last July. But uh, outside EG and CT for abdominal pain, he suddenly developed abdominal pain. And uh, in the stomach, you can see a very huge uh, ulcerative infiltrative region in the lower body of lesser curvature. And CT scan showed the multiple uh, uh, Environment. So, so the interval of this image and this image is just six months. Yeah, very very aggressive nature. So, um, so in the first endoscopic biopsy at the local hospital, the biopsy was negative, but uh, only regenerative atypical cells. So, uh, what? Would you suspect in this case? Yes, it was done five, three years ago, six months, the endoscopy was clean. But suddenly, he developed severe abdominal pain, and the endoscopy is so different. So, Professor Min, what was your impression in this case? I don't like no idea? Yeah. <laughs> OK. Actually, I suspected lymphoma because the lymphoma can develop very quickly. So I suspected gastric lymphoma and explained to the patient, okay, gastric adenocarcinoma is not like this. So some kind of lymphoma is possible. So I did PET scan and we did uh, EGD again after referral. And the pathology was not conclusive. Once again, the, <laughs> uh, the pathology was not conclusive. There are multiple uh, atypical cells, but we cannot make an answer. So please do multiple endoscopic biopsy again. <laughs> that was our answer. So actually, there are a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, immunohistochemical studies uh, uh, Anyway, this is this was the pathology. So I I'm not a pathology specialist, so I would ask Professor An, uh, what's your interpretation for this uh, uh, pathology? Uh, is it the first biopsy? So the, the first biopsy at my institution. The answer uh, was <laughs> like this. The, the report was like this. Do you have any comment on? This report. Okay. The, these blue cells yeah. are not normal yeah, because yeah, this yeah. is not round lymphocytes yeah. and this is not normal gastric mm. epithelium. Oh, these are, I can say this is atypical cells and it, it can be a uh, malignancy. Yeah. But about the immunohistochemistry, we cannot define the lineage. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we cannot conclude that this is lymphoma or carcinoma mm -hmm. or sarcoma. So this is very atypical, but the uh, immunohistochemistry uh, does not fit any tumor. Mm, and tumor. So, so this is, so the diagnosis was not provided like, definitely, that's the reason. Mm. Okay, so when we see the atypical cells in our biopsy, uh, we don't have any feeling whether <laughs> it is atypical regenerative or <laughs> very strongly atypical malignant. <laughs> so anyway, in that case, we open the endoscopy image and check whether it is malignant or not. And we open the digital pathology and see whether it is uh, uh, ugly or not. When, when I reviewed the digital pathology, it was very ugly to me. <laughs> uh, yeah. So we do uh, EGD immediately after it, we review to an image. And the interim report was something like this. So undifferentiated malignant tumor. And this is our interim report. And our pathologist performed some additional uh, special staining. Uh, in this situation, I thought, uh, so it is not lymphoma because uh, uh, cytokeratin was positive uh, in my memory. 
most in most lymphoma cases, the cytokeratin was negative. So anyway, uh, we waited a few more days, and the final diagnosis was uh, undifferentiated malignant tumor with the BIG1 loss. BIG1 loss is a uh, uh, small car for deficient undifferentiated carcinoma. So when you see the lower, <laughs> very lower uh, immunohistochemical staining, it was a PIG1 loss of expression. So uh, when I review the pathology, yeah, the same thing, very uh, heterogeneous uh, cells with uh, yeah, this uh, group. So why don't why, why don't you make uh, some comment on this uh, uh, pathology? Actually, mm -hmm. this case I diagnosed, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I firstly I suspected lymphoma mm -hmm. or small cell carcinoma, mm -hmm. or maybe uh, I, I added S one hundred for uh, differential diagnosis mm -hmm. for melanoma as mm -hmm. well. Yeah, and melanoma is cytokeratin positive sometimes. Like, but mostly negative. Mostly negative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, because it does not look like primary gastric cancer. It's very different. Mm -hmm. And I uh, initially I performed a uh, LCA for lymphoma mm -hmm. in cytokeratin. And also it is unusual that cytokeratin is only positive for a few cells, mm -hmm. usually for carcinoma mm -hmm. or tumor cells are positive. Mm -hmm. But for this case, only a few cells are positive and it is very undifferentiated. Mm -hmm. So I added BRG1. Okay, yeah. okay. That's why so cytokeratin pattern does not fit into uh, tubular adenocarcinoma or any other type of cancer. So that's why she added a uh, very unusual uh, staining. Anyway, uh, anyway, uh, finally we got the answer. Uh, a kind of undifferentiated carcinoma with a very unique genetic background. Okay. So uh, our final management is was like this. She died one week after the pathologic diagnosis. We did some uh, supportive care in order to start some kind of chemotherapy, but um, he his condition goes down very quickly and died just one week later. So I briefly reviewed the smart car for deficient tumors. Small cut deficient tumors can occur in different uh, parts of the stomach and colon, with 13% occurring at the junction of esophagus and stomach, which is uh, greatly rare. Uh, in another report, uh, there is a report about uh, esophageal smart for deficient tumor and uh, thoracic lung uh, no, uh, smart uh, A deficient tumor, but the smart car deficient gastric cancer is uh, rather rare and highly invasive, highly malignant, and very poor uh, prognosis. So smart core gene is a kind of a tumor suppressor gene. It's located on chromosome 19, and the, uh, the product was BIG1 protein. So if the BIG1 protein is negative, it can be the smart core A gene uh, uh, mutation. And it code, I don't know where, but it, it uh, it called it controls the SWI and SNF. So SWI is a, a switch, switch uh, something I don't know, don't remember. That is chromatin remodeling protein. If there is something wrong, tumor can occur. So and the tumor is very aggressive. So uh, this is the uh, histologically undifferentiated gastric cancer with undifferentiated sometimes, especially in the chest. The tumor can be a uh, rhabdoid in uh, thoracic, uh, uh, this kind of tumor. So uh, this is my first experience of this kind of tumor. Uh, in in a report from um, uh, from Boston, they said the incidence of this tumor is ten percent among on different type of gastric cancers. Okay, so uh, is there any question? Uh, so comments. this cancer is a uh, recurrent or new cancer in this patient? Yeah, exactly. New cancer. New, not, new cancer. Yeah, not related to the uh, ESD case. ESD. Uh, ESD was actually adenoma high grade dysplasia. Yeah. Yeah, so, so uh, what, uh, what is surprising to me was uh, this picture is uh, uh, April 
And this picture was July. So location, six months. Location is different, right? Yeah, location was a little bit different, but yeah, other, different. Ah, okay, other, other pictures, side. other side is uh, ah. well, actually no. Okay. So less of coverture or oh, any this, ah, this area. Side. Yeah, ah, yeah. Okay. So anyway, so uh, so when some dramatic change happens in maybe uh, lymphoma or some kind of undifferentiated tumor. In this case, we, we found a very special uh, genetic uh, changes. Okay.